Uh, good morning, folks. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be uh, hosting Anker today and, and to introduce him. So a little bit about his background. Anker earned his bachelor's degree in biotechnology and biochemical engineering from the prestigious Indian Institute of Technology, after which he trained with the incomparable biophysicist T.J. Ha when he was at the University of Illinois. Um, and Anker made quite a number of discoveries there. And then he went on and did his postdoc at the University of California, San Francisco with Ron Vail. And it was there that I really became uh, aware of, of Anker uh, and his work. Um, he was awarded a, a K99 and has since started his uh, own independent group at, at the Whitehead here in, here in Boston. So a bit about um, how I got familiar with Anker, who amazingly I didn't actually meet in real life until just a moment ago. Um, so oftentimes when people introduce speakers, they talk about how inspiring the work is and that's often a platitude. But in my case, it is very much true. So this paper uh, lived in the sacred space, the top drawer of my bench at Penn when I was in Jim's lab with a, with a very select few papers, right? And this one was really inspiring. And if you actually leaf through this, there's not a page or figure to include the methods that doesn't have a ton of my notes. So this paper really drove a lot of the work I did uh, at Penn. So it's a really real thrill to have Anker here. And so I'll just briefly introduce what I think this paper means for the field. So, so Anker described a process by which nucleic acids independently of proteins can undergo phase transitions. And there's implications here for the etiology of repeat expansion disorders, but separate from that. And I think in parallel to how we have learned much from the aberrant phase transitions of certain neurodegenerative disease RNA binding proteins. So too, I think, will this paper become a paradigm for how we understand RNA-driven self-assembly. There's one more point that I want to add, and that is at a time where really we're reevaluating what it means to be rigorous and reproducible in academic science, this paper also uh, sets a standard. So I had absolutely no experience as an RNA biologist prior to, to um, embarking on work that, that was really driven by this paper. And in a matter of weeks, using um, just the methods section of this paper and reagents that you graciously deposited on Agi, and I was able to recapitulate you know, um, the crux of this in a matter of, of, of weeks, which I think is not a testament to me, but rather to the, to the, to the lucid methods and, and, and the quality of the work. So I'm really excited to, to hear what you have to say and what you've been up to in, in your own lab. And you know, thanks for joining us. I did put in a lot of effort into writing the methods just because I myself was struggling with the terminology, with the methods that were used in the paper. I'm, I'm really glad that you found it useful. And uh, thanks, thanks again, Jill, for inviting me over. It's a real pleasure to see people in real life. And uh, I hope we can ha have some interactive discussion uh, as I present some of the new work that we, we have been doing in my lab. So uh, my lab focuses on RNA in RNA granules. And the basic premise uh, that we are after is that many of these condensates do contain RNA. Their functions are likely related to regulating RNA biology, be it storage and regulated translation in the case of germ granules, neuronal granules, or stress granules, or RNA processing, folding, maturation, as in uh, nucleolus processing bodies, Cajal bodies, and so on. So what we are interested in is how RNA contributes to the formation of these bodies. B, what are the principles by which RNA are specifically recruited or excluded from these bodies? And finally, uh, once RNA does get into one of these bodies, how does it change its folding, its, um, uh, its ability to base pair, bind proteins, and so on? And today I'll share with you some insights that we have gotten on on how nucleic acids themselves phase separate. Uh, most of this work is done by two incredible students, uh, inter an incredible postdoc in my lab, Sumit Majumdar, and an undergraduate student, Daniel Stein, uh, and I'm just going to be the talking head for their work. And uh, feel free to interrupt uh, in between if you have any, any, any questions. Uh, also goes, um, goes for the people on the chat joining us on, on Zoom. So I'll start with a quick refresher on complex coarceration. Nucleic acids bear charge and they readily undergo charge mediated phase separation called complex coarceration. Um, the idea here is that if you have two a mixture of two oppositely charged polymers, 
If you mix them together, polymers will come, uh, will bind each other purely by electrostatic interactions. Low valence ions will be released in the solution. And this entropy gain, when low valence ions are released in the solution, essentially drives um, complexation of these two ions. Um, these complexes crash out from the solution. You end up with a polymer rich phase, uh, which contains a vast majority of the pol polymer and a, and a polymer depleted phase. Uh, and here I'm showing one example from a paper from Sarah Perry, where these uh, complexes are solid, like they precipitate, they are in this elastic rubbery state. Now, if these complexes or this mixture, if it can reach equilibrium, then the ion pairs uh, will constantly remodel and as a result, these complexes will have liquid-like properties. And this state uh, is usually referred to as the coacervate state, uh, and which is, what, uh, which is the terminology that I'll be using for the rest of the talk. Now, uh, this term coacervate was coined about 100 years ago. And uh, I'm showing some excerpts from this paper from 1929. Uh, uh, De Jong and Crude, they observed these spherical clusters when they mixed gum arabic with tannin and some other um, pro denatured proteins. And from these experts, it's, uh, excerpts, it's clear that they were struggling to what exactly call them. Uh, they are unmixed, but it's not really unmixing. Uh, it appears that there was also some conversation about whether these are phase separated or not. Uh, there was some discussion uh, where somebody perhaps called that these visible separation may or may not imply that they are phase separated. Uh, and eventually they chose the term coacervation, uh, which comes from uh, coacervate in Latin, just means to pile up. It also goes along to show uh, how this uh, discussion over terminology has probably stood the test of time and has been ongoing for the last 100 years or so. Okay, uh, these coacervates are all around us. Uh, they find many industries many applications in the day-to-day -day products that we use. They are a part of conditioners, creams for drug delivery, um, for making uh, artificial or synthetic fats and so on. Uh, they're also all around us in biology. And one of my favorite examples comes from the sandcastle worm. So this tiny marine critter lives underwater and it builds this nest by gluing together bits of sand. So here are individual nests uh, or individual uh, dens of these, uh, these worms. And they are built by putting together individual grains of sand one at a time. And if uh, in low tide, uh, you can probably see it along the coast of California. Uh, they decorate the shore. Uh, and here's an example of a larger colony. And the way this, uh, this animal puts glues together these grains of sand is quite interesting. It's a very Herculean task. To, uh, to build a glue that will work underwater. And the solution the, uh, these animals have come, with, come up with uh, relies on polyelectrolyte complex coacervation. Uh, the, um, they, they have this glue which is like epoxy. It's a two component glue which do not see each other when it is inside the worm. It secretes it out, mixes the two things together and applies them on, the, um, on individual um, sand grains. Now the task is to keep this glue together underwater, and that is achieved by complex coacervation of peptides. Uh, these peptides are fairly low complexity. These serines get charged with, uh, with phosphorus, uh, uh, get, get phosphorylated, and there is a complementary uh, set of proteins which bear uh, a positive charge. Now, uh, moving back to nucleic acids. Uh, nucleic acids also are charged, and if one mixes DNA or RNA with an appropriate polymeric cation, one observes complex coacervation. Here I'm showing one example where I've taken a single-stranded DNA, poly T. The DNA is labeled, but it's a homogeneous solution of DNA, so you don't see any inhomogeneities uh, over here. If you mix it with a polycation, uh, like spermine, which is a metabolite present in virtually all cells, basic peptides, proteins, polylysine, supercharged GFP, pick your cation, polycation of choice, uh, one ends up with a DNA-rich phase and a DNA-poor phase. The signal here is arising from a fluorophore that was conjugated to the DNA. Uh, we observe about a thousand-fold enrichment of DNA in these uh, condensed phases, and the rest of the solution is essentially depleted. 
Uh, these type of experiments have been done for several decades now, and in the more recent times, uh, Materel, Sarah Perry, uh, Christine Keating, and Ivan Spruget have used these systems uh, to encapsulate things, to, to make peptide RNA coacerates, and so on. Now, one outstanding question uh, in complex coacervation field, which may be pertinent to our uh, biopolymer-based coacervates, is how do short-range interactions, such as hydrogen bonding, cation pi interaction, pi pi interactions, affect coacervate properties? And this simple poly T single-stranded DNA provides us a relatively um, robust chassis to build on directional base pairing interaction interactions where we know the, intera uh, the, uh, the binding energy, um, and we can, we can then start probing, ask questions about the coacervate properties. So what do I mean by that? Um, we take a string of DNA and incorporate a few GC-rich patches. So here I have a 90-mer DNA where I've incorporated uh, three strings of GGATCC. It's a palindromic sequence. The GGATCC will base pair. Uh, and it'll provide short range cross-linking sites. Right? Uh, the charge on the DNA is the same. Uh, these bases do not essentially ch change um, the charge per unit length of the DNA polymer. Now, if you mix these DNA with polycations, once again, we see complex coacervation and we can start um, um, relating the properties of coacervates with the binding energy. So the idea would be these DNA in the presence of polycations will form coacervates. Hybridization will cross-link DNA and uh, change the properties of coacervates, which we can measure. So does it actually occur? Uh, one uh, property of coacervation or complex coacervation that it is sensitive to low valence cations. For instance, if we make coacervates out of pure poly T DNA, if we increase the amount of sodium chloride, a monovalent cation, these co coacervates are going to dissolve. All the DNA will uh, end up in the solution phase beyond 20, 30 millimolar sodium chloride. Now, if you take another DNA in this case, which can be spared uh, by having GGATCC site interspersed in the poly T backbone, these coacervates are more resilient to salt mediated dissolution. We can play the simple game on and on. Here is another sequence where we have increased the, um, um, the length of this hybridization patch and hence hybridization energy. And these are resilient to about 50 millimolar salt. And we can play this game day in, day out. Uh, base pairing is fairly well characterized and uh, provide, uh, build these kind of phase diagrams as a function of binding energy and uh, find the critical salt concentration up to which uh, this coacervates will survive. Uh, one point that I would like to emphasize here uh, is that we don't have a good way to assess what will be the binding free energy when the DNA has entered into the coacervate phase. And what I'm plotting here on the x-axis is just an input parameter, hybridization energy based on nearest neighbor type calculation in some arbitrarily chosen solution condition. Um, so put in other words, this delta G is an input parameter, which we get from theoretical calculations. And what we are measuring is the coacervate behavior. Uh, on the y-axis, we are getting the experimental readout. Okay? So the take-home message from, uh, from this slide is that base pairing perhaps can stabilize these complex coacervates. There can be an interplay of electrostatic interactions and uh, stacking or hydrogen bonding interactions. Now, what about the behavior of the polymer itself, DNA itself, within this coacervate? Uh, one assay which has been used to assess polymer behavior is fluorescence recovery after photobleaching. Most of you are perhaps already familiar with this game. You photoablate a small region, you watch how long it takes uh, for that bleached fraction to recover, and that reports on molecular mo mobility of the polymer. Now, when we do this experiment with poly T, we photoablate a small region and watch recovery occurs within a fraction of a second, much faster than our instrument's response time. Play the movie again, photoablate a small region, it almost instantaneously recovers. Now, we can start building base pairing interactions similar to the data I showed you in the previous slide. 
uh, we once again end up with these spherical coarser weights. However, in this case, the recovery time scales are about a thousand times slower. It recovers over the course of about 200 to 300 seconds. And because this is DNA, base pairing is fairly well characterized, we can play this game in out, uh, day in, day out. And if we take an extreme case where we are looking at, you can see dinucleotides repeated several times, we end up with these solid rubbery elastic precipitates, which do not exhibit fluorescence recovery upon photobleaching, indicating that the DNA molecules are just stuck in space and do not move around. So these are three extreme, uh, two extreme cases and one data point in the middle. We can, uh, we can design any kind of um, desirable, if you have a, uh, a recovery time in mind, you can go back and engineer uh, base pairing interactions to, uh, to provide you um, that in the coarser rate. Uh, here I'm showing uh, a collected data on about eight sequences. Uh, on the y-axis is the fluorescence recovery. On the x-axis is the time in the log axis uh, in, 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 uh, on a log scale. And as we move from left to right, uh, we are looking at DNA with increasing hybridization energies. Now, how does this recovery time scale change with increasing binding energy? When we do that, we see a more or less exponential dependence. On this graph, on the y-axis is the recovery time scale, the characteristic time extracted from the frapped recovery curves. And on the x-axis, again, is our input parameter, our theoretical estimation of hybridization energy of two DNA strands. We start seeing this more or less straight line on a log, uh, on a semi-log plot indicating um, the time scale varies exponentially at the hybridization energy. Now, uh, this frat time scales can be converted into polymer self-diffusion coefficient by, by using this kind of a relationship. If we know the, the width of the bleached spot, we can use a simplifying relationship to extract polymer self-diffusion coefficient. Once again, when we do that, we see uh, this exponential scaling of the diffusion coefficient with the hybridization energy. So as we are increasing the hybridization energy, polymer diffuses slower and slower. We can start making uh, predictions on what will be the diffusion coefficients if we know delta G. Now, uh, this was, uh, um, so again, just to emphasize this, D self is scaling as um, exponentially with delta G. I'm not showing the temperature data, but, but, um, but to get the point, uh, as we increase the temperature, the, the polymer diffuses faster. So uh, these base pairing interactions change phase behavior, they change polymer mobility. We can also start asking questions about the macroscopic properties of these coasserates. There is another assay uh, where we can watch the fusion of two droplets. And these fusion time scales are dependent on A, the size of the droplet itself. These droplets have higher viscosity than the surrounding medium. Uh, then um, surface tension is going to try to bring the droplets closer. So viscosity is going to prevent that. And this re, uh, relaxation time scale will be directly proportional to the droplet size, viscosity of the droplet, and inversely proportional to the surface tension. We can watch these droplets fuse. When they initially start uh, just kissing each other, the aspect ratio would be close to two if the droplets are of similar size. And when they have relaxed to a spherical geometry, the aspect ratio will be one. And when we uh, plot this aspect ratio as a function of time, we see an exponential relationship, similar to what many, many other people have described before. And this allows us to extract uh, the characteristic time scales of fusion. So each data point is a characteristic time scale extracted from an exponential um, fusion curve. And we have done many experiments for droplet pairs of different sizes. And these plots allow us to extract uh, this ratio, viscosity to surface tension, also known as the inverse capillary velocity. Can we can play the same game. We can do this for many, many DNA sequences and get this inverse capillary velocity as a function of delta G. And to our surprise, we again see this exponential scaling, the ratio of viscosity and surface tension scales exponentially with the hybridization energy. Uh, so it's a bit surprising, and I'll cut out uh, 
some additional data here, but suffice it to say that what we find is that the surface tension of these droplets is not substantially changing when we change the uh, dehybridization patch. And just the viscosity alone is scaling um, with the hybridization energy. So we see that phase behavior, the polymer self diffusion, the microscopic properties of these coacylates are scaling with the dehybridization short range, uh, the interaction energy of these short range patches. Show one more piece of data. Um, when we, what happens if we mix two distinct polymers? So in this case, a poly T DNA, which does not form any base pairing interactions or appreciable base pairing interactions, and another DNA which can self hybridize. So here is one such movie. At time t is equal to zero, we inject uh, a polyketine in the solution, which triggers complex coacylation. Uh, the two DNA strands are labeled with different fluorophores. And what you'll see over time is that in these complex coacylates, the two DNA strands are separating from one another. They're spontaneously going uh, partitioning into two distinct compartments. And we end up uh, with a compartment which is enriched in poly T and another compartment which is enriched in a sequence that can be spare. Um, can zoom into these uh, droplets. Um, so here in the red is the non-base pairing sequence and green is the sequence that can base pair. And what you can appreciate is that they form this crescent geometry with certain interfacial tension um, and the two DNA are self-segregated, the two, two, two compartments. Can we can play this game as a function of binding energy. Um, on the top, uh, in the data that I'm going to show you in the next, um, for the next minute or so, the top slide with top image will be the non base pairing DNA P90. The, the middle row will be the base pairing competent, competent DNA, and the bottom will be the overlay. So, in this case, the interaction patch is just 4XGC, really low binding energy, and the two DNA are virtually overlapped with one another. So, we increase the binding energy, uh, can we do not see substantial compartmentalization? Beyond a critical value, critical difference in hybridization energy, we start observing this compartmentalization, two DNA spontaneously going to two different compartments. We, as we increase uh, the difference, uh, we see a greater and greater partitioning. Poly T prefers to be in the poly T rich phase, uh, the base pairing competent DNA prefers to be in the other phase. Um, if you keen eye, you'll also notice that the it's not just the partitioning, but also the contact angles are changing. Uh, it's some interesting scaling with binding energy in, in this scenario. Now, one can measure how much DNA is in the poly T poor phase and poly T rich phase, right? So if you have a compartment like this, we can calculate what is the concentration of our favorite DNA in one compartment versus the other compartment that can give you information on partitioning. Keep on, we do, uh, what, what we find is that up to a critical difference in binding energy, this phi A to phi B ratio is one, or in other words, we do not see any compartmentalization. As we start increasing this difference, we, we, uh, we can reconstruct this entire um, coexistence curve where the solution splits into a polymer a poly T poor and a poly T rich phase. So really a uh, chewed experiment and it took, my, uh, took some me a really long time and, uh, to get this data and he's really, really proud of it. You may have seen these uh, coexistence curves as a function of um, temperature or as a function of salt if you're dealing with co complex coacid rates. And I want to, what I want to emphasize here, we are looking at uh, this coexistence curve as a function of difference in binding energies given P. Okay, uh, so that was a lot of physical chemistry uh, and um, this scaling, exponential scaling with uh, interaction energies. This is, to the best of my knowledge, is not really observed for complex coacylates, but there are, there are precedents for neutral polymers. 
uh, this famous uh, theory from Rubenstein and Semenov um, states that when you have associative polymers, which can uh, cross-link with one another at multiple sites, the lifetime of this association bond essentially dictates the properties, the macroscopic properties of the coacervates. So let me rephrase that. Uh, for this polymer to diffuse within a semi-dilute solution, in this case, a neutral polymer, which can cro get cross-linked at multiple sites, the diffusion will require breaking of, breaking of polymer, polymer cross-links. Um, and the lifetime of this bond will scale with uh, the binding energy or the energy of that bond. Essentially, tau bond would be some microscopic time, t tau naught, multiplied by e to the power e by kt, where e is the interaction energy. And what we are finding is that this tau bond in our case, or this e in our case with DNA, is just the hybridization energy. What this means is that perhaps the DNA, the charged polymer within our coacervates, is essentially behaving like a neutral polymer in semi-dilute solution. Depending on how you want to think about it, it's really either it's really trivial or really profound. Uh, again, I'll repeat it. A charged polymer, charged DNA in the coacervate phase is following the same rules that you would expect a neutral polymer to, be, um, um, to have in semi-dilute regime. So, uh, I'll summarize some key lessons that we have learned from this simple DNA system. And for the rest of my talk, I'll uh, delve into what insights we can get from these physical chemistry experiments with pure DNA and how they can relate to bimolecular condensates in cells. So uh, what I've shown you so far is that non-ionic interactions in our case, base pairing mediated, but you can draw analogies with protein coacervates where you have uh, hydrophobic interactions or pi pi interactions for proteins, they may tune the material properties of complex coacervates. You may have encountered these kind of data uh, in other publications where TDP43 or tau may form complex coacervates and certain mutations may change uh, tau tau interaction energies. And as a result, there was a change in the viscoelastic properties or material properties um, of, of, of the condensate. Number two, a kind of a corollary of the first one, um, complex coacervation in the, in the material science world can be a route to generate micron-sized self-assembling DNA-based materials. Probably familiar with origamis where we rely on the specificity of the DNA bond to create crystalline structures, the origamis, where the charge on the DNA backbone is neutralized by low valence cations. Uh, scaling up of origamis to larger dimensions is, is challenging. And here, perhaps, by relying on that, that negative charge on the backbone, we can create micron size or even larger materials. And third, um, again, I want to reiterate this point. Um, charged polymers in the coacervates are behaving like neutral polymers in semi-dilute solution. That is perhaps the reason why some of the existing theories apply so well for protein coacer or protein-based condensates, which may have some component of electrostatic interactions. Yeah. That was really beautiful. I, I just have a question. Um, so I was surprised about the crescent um, architecture of those droplets. Can you yeah. comment a little bit what that means in terms of surface tension and... Absolutely. So I think uh, Omar Saleh and others have done beautiful work on uh, do, uh, building these kind of systems with, uh, um, with DNA nanostars. And uh, this interfacial tension essentially will, um, uh, the geometry that we obtain essentially reflects on the uh, interfacial tension. What the system is going to try to do is minimize its total surface tension, uh, which includes uh, surface area, uh, one interface with the, of the coacervate with the aqueous solution, plus um, some energy which will be at the interface. Uh, and what we find essentially, um, maybe I have a backup slide that I can show in a bit. Um, if the interaction energy difference is relatively small, 
we see a larger interface, the non-base pairing DNA always occupies the uh, concave shape, the smaller, or the convex shape, the smaller side of the interface. Uh, and as we start uh, making the difference larger, uh, 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 the curvature changes. Is that where you were going or? Uh, Okay. And uh, there are some interesting theories, uh, or there is only one interesting theory that we can, relevant theory that we can find, find here. We'll be happy to chat about it about after, after the talk. Other questions? Uh, okay, yeah. Diana's question. Uh, so you described the two phase uh, coarsivates, and I was just wondering from a biological point of view, like, do you see something like, like a heterogeneous biomolecular condensate? inside cells maybe in five minutes all right <laughs> <laughs> i look forward to it okay and the last bit is that uh, these kind of um, the observations that we're making may have implications for rna and dna delivery uh, if you have done plasmid transfections or delivered dna or rna oligonucleotides nucleotides to the cell you're often relying on cationic lipids or polyethylenamine, some charge, positively charged polymer, and you're making a complex. What our results show is that this complexation is going to be dependent on the sequence of the DNA or RNA molecule. If you have a GC rich, let's say a small um, RNA that you're trying to deliver, the same cationic peptide, it may end up in these precipitate-like state not sure how much of it will be available or how the availability translates to the material properties of the coasserate that one is making. Um, and um, it may also have some relevance with um, intracellular condensates based on proteins. We are just extracting insights using DNA as a model polymer. Um, and, and, and the same rules may apply for protein-based condensates. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So th th that is what many of these systems are designed to do when you make plasmid uh, and uh, mix it with uh, polyethylene amine. The cation is selected and the concentration of cation is selected such that it can withstand uh, the ionic strength of the, of the medium. And I guess analogous rules will apply when people are trying to deliver nucleic acids um, that, uh, in living animals. Uh, can you repeat that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll move on to what insights can this synthetic system provide uh, on cellular RNP granules, Maria, that are, which is where our real interests lie. Now, I'll briefly introduce one system that we have worked on previously, uh, in these, um, which comes from these nucleotide repeat expansion disorders. Uh, just as a quick recap, these are genetic neurological diseases. Uh, some better known examples are Huntington disease, fragile X syndrome, myotonic dystrophy, and certain forms of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And uh, the cause of the DNA here is an unstable repeat, often GC rich, that gets copied too many times. Uh, for instance, in the case of Huntington disease, there is a CAG patch which gets copied too many times. In unaffected individuals, there are fewer CAG repeats in the affected individuals. Are, uh, now, uh, one feature of these disorders, if one stains for the repeat containing RNA, that accumulates in the nucleus and these domains referred to as foci. Uh, here I'm showing data collected from many, many publications. And the scheme is in blue is the nucleus. And staining, uh, this staining is done using fluorescence in situ hybridization, staining for the repeat or the transcript that may contain the DNA. And across this uh, 10 or so diseases, and uh, what you'll see is that in virtually all cases, the RNA is accumulating in these clustered domains inside the nucleus. Uh, you can recapitulate these domains uh, in vitro or in, uh, by in vitro, I mean in, in cell culture, by just expressing a repeat containing transcript. And it correlates, this, uh, this um, assembly of RNA in these domains requires a threshold number of repeats. 
furthermore, it co correlates with disease in animal models. Several studies have used these foci as disease biomarkers for testing therapies that may potentially work uh, to rescue symptoms. Now, um, this is mostly published data. Uh, what we showed uh, about five years now is that these GC-rich RNA can form hairpin-like structures. And if one makes hairpins longer and longer, these RNA may start having, besides intramolecular uh, hairpins, they can start forming intermolecular structures. I'm depicting three different strands of RNA in three different colors. And in cells, uh, we developed this minimal system where we put in some test sequence, test repeats, tagged with MS2 hairpin system, um, which, uh, which is derived from phage. And by expressing a cognate protein tagged with GFP, we can visualize the RNA. And we put the system under a drug inducible promoter so that we can watch these bodies in real time. Uh, this works fairly well. If we put in 47 or above a threshold number of repeats, we observe RNA accumulating in these domains. Low number of repeats, it does not. And this allowed us to um, demonstrate that these foci, which were observed primarily as static pictures in fixed cells, uh, they are behaving like liquid, or at least RNA is getting exchanged both within these foci and with the nucleoplasm. So, what can our experiments with this physical chemistry experiments with single-stranded DNA uh, tell us about uh, these one class of RNP granules that we are making in cells? The first is that, uh, first prediction, uh, our model is that these foci, or at least RNA recruitment to these foci is based on a combination of electrostatic and base pitting interactions. Charge is perhaps getting neutralized by either cations in the cell or some polymers which bear positive charge. Now in test tubes, we find that these coacylates are sensitive to salt con concentration. What about in cells? So here, if we treat uh, one cell which has these RNA domains with an increasing amount of salt, uh, we, should, we expect these foci to dissolve. In this case, we have chosen ammonium acetate as, as our ion of choice, I can, I can uh, discuss later why we think that is the appropriate choice in this case. And as soon as we treat the cells at time t is equal to zero, what you will see is that immediately these foci disrupt. Over time, we'll start seeing effects of uh, osmotic stress and so on, but at these short time scales, within seconds after addition of ammonium acetate, uh, the behavior that we are observing, we think it's just coming because of dissolution of electrostatic interactions. Go ahead. Uh, that's a really cool result. Have you tried this with chelators, like EGTA, EDTA? We have not done that, um, primarily because we are worried whether how effectively they go into the cells and what other effects that may have up to the, this point. It's more or less a toy experiment uh, showing that these, these bodies are actually susceptible to salt-mediated dissolution. It's not just these RNA foci, several other bodies speckles in particular appear to be held together by electrostatic interactions, at least um, in, in our, um, uh, um, or that, that's what we believe. Now, uh, the second prediction will be that the biophysical properties of these domains will depend on base pairing interactions. In test tubes, we see that as we increase the extent of base pairing, we see in uh, reduced uh, mobility of the DNA in the coasser rate, going all the way to rubbery plastics, rubbery, rubbery solids. So does, this, uh, does that happen? So uh, virtually all of these diseases are caused by GC rich repeat expansion. I showed you data with CAG repeats. Uh, there are diseases caused by CTG repeat expansions. And if we express an RNA with CTG or CUG repeats, again, it starts accumulating in these domains. If we conduct analogous experiments now with an AT-rich RNA, which can form similar architecture. Uh, when expressed at equivalent levels, uh, we do not observe it accumulating as foci or in these domains in the nucleus. So if we diminish base pairing, we do not observe these bodies forming. What about increasing the extent of base pairing? Um, so here I'll first introduce some data on CAG repeat containing RNA. These foci 
the RNA at these foci is mobile and it rapidly recovers if you photoablate a small region. Uh, here I've done partial photobleaching and what you'll notice is the, that the RNA flows from both directions and fills in this hole. Now, uh, nature provides a cruel example where the interaction strength has been increased naturally um, in the case of this ALS associated repeat. Uh, so this disease, one of the mutations associated with this disease is this GGGGCC hexanucleotide repeat expansion. Uh, the sequence besides forming what's in Crick base pairing may also form G quadruplexes, which are more thermostable than your standard uh, what's in Crick base pairing. And here I'm drawing a cartoon of what a multi-molecular um, cluster of GGC, GGCC repeat containing RNA may look like. You can have intramolecular, uh, intermolecular G quadruplexes combined with some extent of what's in Crick base pairing. Now, if you repeat a similar experiment, these RNA also accumulate in, the do in these domains inside the nucleus. However, if we photoablate a small region, now they do not recover, suggesting that base pairing does modulate the mobility of RNA in these domains around these clusters. Or maybe I should say intermolecular RNA or interactions. And again, nothing else has changed between the two experiments except the sequence of, of this RNA. Likewise, um, this ability to perturb interactions may potentially provide ways to break these aggregates in cells. Uh, here is one example where we have used a drug doxorubicin. It's an intercalator that destabilizes DNA, DNA base pairs. Also, it's nonspecific and also destabilizes RNA, RNA base pairs. And when we treat cells from myotonic dystrophy type one uh, patient fibroblast, uh, so in, in the untreated case, we observe a certain number of foci. If you treat these cells with a low dose of doxorubicin, we observe about a 90% reduction in foci number and their size, providing at least a proof, a proof of principle that um, playing with base pairing may be a route to disassemble uh, these bodies. And uh, last, I guess, would be that self-associating RNAs may segregate within foci, question uh, that was asked a few minutes earlier. So to, to demonstrate that, uh, we used these two different sequence of RNA, CAG repeat, which forms foci, G4C2 repeat that forms foci, but our hypothesis is that uh, the foci of CAG repeat RNA are held together by CAG, CAG interactions, the other ones are held together by G4C2, G4C2 interactions. So when we co-express the two RNAs, um, should observe foci, and that's what uh, we do. I'll show you data in the next slide. Uh, here, what we are doing is fluorescence in C2 hybridization. Uh, this is the nucleus of one cell. We are staining for CAG repeat containing RNA using a CTG probe. We're staining for G4C2 repeat containing RNA here with, a, with an appropriate probe. And when we overlay the two images, at least with the diffraction limited microscopy, we observe that the two RNA are co-localized. Uh, so they are going, they are forming foci and foci and likely going to the same site. However, now if you use, uh, you know, the resolution of diffraction limited microscopy is limited to about half a micron. Uh, if you use better tricks like uh, stimulated emission depletion, uh, depletion or STED in this case, uh, here I'm zooming in on one such punctum. And in magenta uh, are the CAG repeat or CAG repeat containing RNA. In green are the G4C2 repeat containing RNA. And now what you'll start appreciating is that they are segregating to, from one another in distinct domains. Uh, at the bottom is another such example. Again, the scale bar is 500 nanometer. We are zooming into a single punctum. Uh, we can look at the line profile. If we uh, just draw a line against this region, it becomes more or less obvious that they are segregated from one another. Although uh, we don't have sufficient Z resolution, they may be stacked on top of each other. So this, uh, this is an underrepresentation of, of the segregation. Okay, I think I'm almost out of time and I'll just summarize here. So three key take home messages that I want to convey today. Uh, number one, 
short range interactions can tune properties of electrostatic interaction uh, driven complex class arrays. Uh, in the case of simple DNA system, uh, we see this the scaling with the lifetime of DNA DNA bond. I think this may these kind of experiments may allow us to get away from more or less droplet zoology to building a, uh, a framework of how we relate interaction energies to the, to the behavior of these glass arrays or droplets. Number two, uh, these complex glass arrays or the DNA within these complex glass arrays is behaving like neutral polymer in semi-dilute solution, which allows us to bring in existing theories that were devised for semi-dilute solutions and start assessing complex glass arrays. And last, uh, this may have some implications for cellular RNA granules. And most notably, we think that pathogenic foci of repeat containing RNA are forming via a combination of electrostatic interactions and base pairing interactions uh, that provides us some insights uh, potentially on how we can target these foci in disease. We may have some lessons for how RNA or even proteins may partition into cellular RNA granules. Um, last, I'll thank uh, the people who did all the work. Um, majority of the work that I showed you today was done by Sumit Majumdar and Daniel Stein. Um, parts of work uh, about repeat expansion disorder were conducted in, um, uh, when I was in Ron, Ron's lab uh, at UCSF. Uh, some experiments and measurement of viscosity were conducted uh, at Bastion Coop and Nikita Fakri's lab at MIT. Of course, I have to thank all the funding sources that allow us to conduct this work. Um, thank you all for the attention, both here and on Zoom, and I'll be happy to take, uh, take questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. Who has questions? Use the mic so the people at home can hear you, Jesse. Hello, thanks for your talk. Um, can you comment on how the formation of those RNA foci affects RAN translation or the translation of the flanking gene? Um, and whether or not when you dissolve it with, I think you used ammonium acetate, uh, how does that affect you know, um, the repeat proteins? Yeah, so maybe uh, just to bring everyone on the same page in these repeat expansion disorders, um, there are two uh, types of RNA toxicity that have been observed, if that's the right term that I'm using. One, the RNA can accumulate in the nucleus at these domains as foci. Another peculiar observation has been that these repeat containing RNA get translated or produce protein products in all three frames without necessarily requiring uh, a canonical open reading frame or a start codon called repeat associated non-EUG translation. So what we find is that because the RNA is stuck in the nucleus, it does not undergo RAN translation. The RAN translating RNA are actually in the cytoplasm of the cell. Uh, and I'm happy to chat later on how we, uh, we think that the species that are resulting in RAN translation, the RNA molecules that are resulting in RAN translation, they are distinct from the ones that are trapped in the nucleus. It's a great question though. It was a big conundrum to us. Like if the RNA is going inside the nucleus, why is it producing protein products and not just regular protein products, it's aberrant translation products. So there are two distinct pools of RNA that we find, uh, one in the nucleus and the, uh, and the other on the side of the Eric has a question. I, guess I have a question that kind of comes up observing these structures here, which is to say that there's a lot of empty spots in them. And if, I'm understanding your model correctly. Essentially, it should just suck up all RNA, uh, regardless of whether it's what you've put into the cell or not. Yeah. Uh, so it kind of gets me thinking that the only reason why these are discrete puncta and not just huge kind of conglomerates of RNA is that a lot of RNA is chaperoned by H and RMPs, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. So can you make some connection between sort of Perhaps if you eliminated some HNRMPs or protein chaperones, can you modulate the size or yeah. structure of these? Yeah, so I assume you are referring to these images and why do we see these uh, essentially blank regions? Uh, so here we are using STED, but that still has a resolution limit of around 40, 50 nanometers. 
uh, and we are observing you know, these exaggerated uh, structures uh, while just proving our own RNA of interest. There are plenty of other RNAs inside these structures. Notably, we know MALAT1 is also there and likely several other cellular RNAs that we have not seen for. Of course, there are going to be a large number of proteins uh, as well, H and R and Ps. Uh, we would know some SR family proteins go there. Uh, so uh, these empty spaces that we are observing are likely just occupied by many, many such proteins. Uh, if you have a good target in mind of which RN H and R and P we should hit, we'd love to do that. We have tried to hit a few of them. We don't see essentially any change in structure. speaks to the fact if things are not, RNAs aren't chaperoned by proteins, then they're more likely to end up in uh, condensates like this. Is that that, that's a great point. I don't know how, th that's a great point. So what you are saying essentially, maybe if I can rephrase, um, if the RNA doesn't find a protein binding partner, they are more likely to base pair. I do not, I would love to test that directly, but we don't have a good way to do that. How do we distinguish between an RNA that is just not base paired versus not bound by another, another protein? Easier to do it bottom up than, than in cells. Balaji. Thanks. Um, my question was, if you observed any biases in these fossil formation between nuclei and cytoplasm, the reason I ask is because many of viral genomes have CPG suppression in their genomes. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if that was an evolutionary way to basically prevent these foresight formation. And my second part of the question was, are there any cellular proteins that suppress these foresight formations specifically in the cytoplasm, which have been shown that there are certain proteins such as ZAP, for example, um, you know, binds to the CPG islands and uh, prevent viral transcription. So on right. those notes, you know, if you have any biases between cytoplasm and nucleus. Right. So maybe I, I can split into, I'll, I'll answer the, first, the second part first. So are there any proteins which are modulating uh, maybe the export of the RNA? Several labs uh, have uh, done screens uh, that are interested in RAN translation modifiers. And they're um, often uh, nuclear pore components or the RNA transport machinery shows up. Uh, we are also running some screens, but we are not able to find anything beyond those standard RNA export factors. There's nothing specific to the CAG repeats that we could identify so far, or specific to G4C2 repeats either. Um, can you remind me the first question again? Right. So is there any bias between, uh, or um, what determines the partitioning between nucleus and cytoplasm? Oh. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we do not see foci in the cytoplasm, at least in these cases. The RNA in the cytoplasm, if it is there, appears to be well dispersed. Now, a key caveat here, which we recently encountered, is that once those repeats start getting translated in the cytoplasm through RAN or non-RAN translation, they start co-aggregating with the peptide products. So let me just repeat that. Once the CAG repeat containing RNA goes into the cytoplasm and starts getting aberrantly translated, the RNA co-aggregates with the peptide and we do not know yet whether it's entirely base pairing mediated, protein RNA mediated, or if there is a third, third game at play. Uh, maybe relevant to this talk, what I can, I can share is that we see that G4C2 RNA is more in the nucleus than CAG repeat containing RNA. So at identical repeat length and RNA copy numbers, more base pairing will lead to more, re more retention in, in the nucleus. And we think primarily these foci are forming via transcribe the RNA, the RNA can get clustered and just are retained and do not make it out to, to the cytoplasm. There's a question online from Gable. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask? Maybe if, oh, Omar, it's, uh, uh, thank you. I'm so glad that you are uh, at the talk. Anyway, yeah, go oh, ahead, Gable. doesn't have a mic. So the question's about temperature. Oh. 
you, you have this melting and annealing protocol through which you generate these in, yep. in vitro. Can you comment on the effects of temperature on the behavior of the RNA coacervates? So in this case, in all the data that I've shown you today with the DNA, we do not do any denaturation or annealing. We had to do it in our previous paper because RNA purification protocols intrinsically involve precipitating RNA. By precipitating, I mean cross-linking the RNA and making you know, uh, base pairs by salt and polyamines and, and so on. Here we can buy commercial RNA from, from a vendor which comes with decent amount of salt and there is not sub, uh, substantial clustering. Um, so there, there is no annealing protocol involved in the data that I showed you today. Siddharth. Uh, that was a, whoa, um, that was a pretty awesome talk. Um, so have you considered assessing uh, like the changes in material properties when you reconstitute different repeat containing DNA and RNA together? Because you show the experiments where you're reconstituting, you know, DNA with yeah. different repeated sequences and then experiments with just RNA, but how about both together? So, um, well, what we were trying to do is use DNA instead of polystyrene and get insights for how proteins and RNA may behave. I guess what you are asking is uh, perhaps if you have double-stranded DNA and it's getting transcribed, how would that affect uh, uh, this granule formation or something? Right. Right. So, yeah. So th these things are called R loops, and they are observed in, in in several cases. We haven't tried to do that in our, in our hands, but there are reports that in repeat expansion diseases there are R loops, which may be contributing to fragility of DNA or a breakage of DNA at these repeat sites. Is it working? Oh, okay. Do you think the reason why peptides are uh, making some sort of aggregates with the repeat, uh, repeat sequences is some kind of uh, peptide-based mechanism of uh, translation regulation? Like the peptide acts as a feedback loop uh, and that's why it's just like over and over it's, it's possible, we just don't know enough about the system yet. Yeah, it may be cells way of shutting down translation. Um, it's still in the works, so we, I won't be able to comment beyond that. Thank you. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. So Ankur, I'm very intrigued by uh, the data which you've shown for the fusion time scale. Mm -hmm. and it depends on the size of the condensates or the droplets. Could you share some more information on that? Like I thought you mentioned that as the size becomes bigger, it becomes difficult for fusion to happen. Is that right or is it the other way? No, so as the droplets get larger, it's not more difficult, but the time that it takes for the droplets to fuse gets larger and larger. So uh, two droplets which are micron size, they will fuse faster than two droplets of same material, which are, let's say, a millimeter in size. Okay. So I was thinking more from the cellular context, like, you know, when you look under a microscope, you see multiple condensates, given time, like, do you suppose there might be an upper limit to fusion events also? Right, well, in the cell, you have um, uh, true barriers that prevent diffusion, like cytoskeleton, or in the case of nucleus, you have a lot of DNA, which may just physically occlude droplets from coming next to each other. Uh, these models and theories are, are for solutions of polymers, so solutions or droplets of polymers in pure solution. Makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I have a question about dosorucibin for inhibiting the uh, DM1 condensate yeah. formation, stress granule formation. We know that molecule is a DNA intercalator and also is the inhibitor of DNA yeah. polymerase. So what do you think is the mechanism action in yeah. that particular? So the time scales that we are looking at, we don't think there is a substantial change in transcription rate. Uh, these are done within a couple of hours after addition of drug. Uh, 
and we don't think there is any change in RNA uh, transcription rates. We don't have the data in patient cells, but we can do experiments in our synthetic cell lines where we can regulate transcription. Um, what would be the um, implications for the mechanism? Do you think it's just physically, you know, putting it in excess, it's just uh, uh, disrupting many, many base pairing interactions, and one of them happens to be in our RNA of interest. It also uh, impacts nucleoli and, uh, and, and, uh, and many other places where you have substantial RNA secondary structure or RNA-RNA interactions. Okay, I think that's... Avi had a question on Zoom. Avi, do you want to go ahead? Are you still there? Oh, can we... Oh, go ahead. There he is. Oh, you're muted, I think. Can you hear me now? Yep. yep. Great. Hi. Hi, Ankur. Nice to see you. Well, not see you, but hear you. Uh, <laughs> anyways. Likewise. Uh, in, in terms of, um, you know, you showed this stead images, right? So now we know that we have some got extra information, ultra structural information about uh, this repeat expansion RNA. So can you think, like, tell us a little bit as to how you are thinking of using that extra information in order to get an extra understanding of the disease or in terms of, you know, using that information for developing therapies, you know, just would love to hear your comments on that. It's a great question. Uh, to be very honest, I haven't thought about what implications it would have for, for disease itself. It does certainly tell us that um, these RNA are segregated and likely that is the reason that we don't see toxicity on short time scales where we have foci. They do not they sequester certain proteins, but they're just likely clustered outside from uh, make a small subregion in the speckle. I have to think a bit more about what implications it would have for the disease. That's a great question. We are just doing it as a, more or less as a proof of concept experiment <laughs> at this stage. Wonderful, thank you. All right, well, join me in thanking Ankur for visiting us and a great talk. Thank you. Yes, fabulous talk. Thanks again for coming to our kitchen table. And thanks everybody on Zoom and in the room for joining today and uh, see us again in a month or two. Thanks again.